Independent Republic of Mike Graham. <laughs> Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. And good afternoon. I'm Ian Collins and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Coming up, the countdown is on for that budget as the Tories plunge to a new low in the polls. Can the Conservatives convince you they still are the right party to govern Britain? Where did it all go wrong from such a large majority back in 2019? We'll have more on that next. Also, Princess Kate is set to return to public duties at the Trooping of the Colour. The palace confirmed the news after the Ministry of Defence accidentally announced it prior to consent. Oh dear. More on that shortly as well. And Birmingham City Council will today vote on inflicting misery on their residents with ballooning council taxes and a raft of cost-cutting measures. We'll be live on the ground a little bit later in the show. And of course, it's your call. This show is all about your responses and your opinions. We're asking this question, is there anything the Tories can do to win back your vote? We'll open up the lines on this now. 0344 499 1000. You can text 87222. Or on the socials, it's at Talk TV. First, let's get the latest news headlines with Divya. Good afternoon. The Chancellor is preparing to freeze fuel duty for another year in a budget boost for drivers. Jeremy Hunt is expected to announce tomorrow he'll extend the 5p cut in petrol and diesel, which was due to expire this month. The decision will cost the Treasury around £5 billion. Despite the benefit to motorists, though, former Home Office adviser Claire Pearsall told Talk TV it will be difficult for the Tories to claw back popularity. I think people are incredibly angry. There has been nothing to give people hope. Quite interestingly, there was a poll of under 35s who are moving away from the Conservative Party in droves. It's now down into single figures. So young people aren't coming forward to support the Conservative Party. To the US now, where it's Super Tuesday and voters in 16 states and one US territory prepare to cast their votes to decide on who they want to run for president. Both Democratic President Joe Biden and Republican frontrunner Donald Trump are hoping for victories that will help them move beyond the primaries. Republican strategist Amy Tarkanian told Talk TV Trump will be ready to face off against Biden once more. And, and he is tanking. He's either even or tanking with, uh, with his own party. Uh, demographics who have historically voted uh, pretty, pretty handily for Democrats. Um, he's also struggling with, whether it deal with African-Americans, Hispanics, or even the Muslim community. And, and so, you know, this, this is Donald Trump's best scenario is that they keep Biden as their nominee. Birmingham City Council will today vote on a wave of cuts to local services and whether it will raise council tax by 21% over the next two years as it tries to plug a huge hole in its finances. The largest local authority in Europe declared itself effectively bankrupt last year and is now trying to make £300 million worth of savings. Talk TV reporter Nick Ellaby is in Birmingham. Some huge cuts. Uh, coming up for Birmingham because they've got a debt of about £87 million, partly because they owe a billion in unpaid worker disputes as well. And huge and very, very ang angry reaction from the people on the streets of Birmingham to what they see as financial mismanagement from the Labour Council here. More than 40,000 migrants have crossed the channel in small boats since Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister. The Home Office say more than 400 migrants made the dangerous crossing on Monday, the highest daily number so far this year. Labour have slammed the Prime Minister for failing to deliver on his pledge to stop small boat crossings. The Princess of Wales will attend her first royal event in June after undergoing abdominal surgery back in January. The Ministry of Defence says Kate will return to duties at the Troop in the Colour Ceremony, but this hasn't been confirmed by Kensington Palace. She paused all official work to recover from a planned operation. And the 90s hit show Baywatch is set to return to our TV screens in an action-packed reboot. The show, originally starring David Hasselhoff and Pamela Anderson, was one of the most watched in the world when it ran for a total of 11 seasons. The new series will be seen on Fox in the US 25 years after the last episode aired. That's the latest weather time now with Nazanin Gaffa.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, we've had a real mixed bag of conditions out there across the UK for today. Some have had cloudy skies, cool conditions under the cloud and outbreaks of rain mainly across the eastern parts of the UK. There's also been a bunch of heavy and thundery showers moving eastwards along southern counties, but everywhere else it's been mostly fine, dry and sunny, except across western Scotland we've seen some light and patchy rain there and a few scattered showers here and there, but nothing too bad. And it's felt warm in the sunshine, milder than recently, temperatures up to around 11 degrees Celsius, but a lot cooler only in to the high single figures across parts of the east. Now, overnight, we'll see the bunch of showers across the southeast eventually clear away, but the cloud clings on around eastern coastal areas, so it will be a less cold night compared to further west, where it will be clear and chilly with a frost likely, especially across parts of Wales and the west country. There will be the return of mist and fog patches for central and southern parts of England and Wales as well. That will be quite slow to clear through tomorrow morning, but eventually we'll see the sunshine return again for most of uh, western Scotland, northwest England, Wales, the Midlands, central southern England and later I think eastern England will start to brighten up but the northeast of England, eastern Scotland still staying rather cloudy and cool with patchy light rain and drizzle. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. And good afternoon. So here's a question. Where did it all go wrong? The Tories stormed through with a landslide victory back in 2019, winning a string of seats from Corbyn's Labour Party in its traditional Red War heartlands. Riding high off the coattails of the Brexit referendum, the new Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, was set on course to deliver the Conservatives' strongest performance in decades. It does look as though this one-nation Conservative government has been given a powerful new mandate yeah. to get Brexit done yeah. and to focus on the priorities of the British people and above all on the NHS. And yes, we will recruit 50,000 more nurses and 6,000 more GPs and we will build 40 new hospitals. Well, fast forward a couple of years and along comes a pandemic ravaging its way through the economy, creating draconian lockdown laws and putting our National Health Service on its knees. But Downing Street had it under control. Number 10 knew how to react. Throw a party. No, in fact, throw 20 parties. Bring on the karaoke, ferry in the beer and the wine and dance until your coccyx can't take it anymore. That was the start of Boris Johnson's fall from grace. And months later... He was gone. But fear not, there was a new kid in town. Enter Liz Truss. Her ambitious promise to boost economic growth with widespread tax cuts and deregulation excited Tory members, marking a move back to the good old-fashioned conservatism lost during the pandemic. Until that is, her budget, containing 45 billion quid's worth in unfunded tax cuts, spooked the financial markets and totally crashed the UK economy and resulted in this excruciating speech. But it is clear that parts of our mini-budget went further and faster than markets were expecting. So the way we are delivering our mission right now has to change. We need to act now to reassure the markets of our fiscal discipline. Yeah, how did that work out? And so another Conservative Prime Minister bit the dust. But fear not, financial bigwig and human pipe cleaner Rishi Sunak was ready and waiting in the wings. Finally, a Prime Minister with a strong background in economics, bringing forth a plan to halve inflation, stop the boats and cut NHS waiting lists. And the heart of that mandate is our manifesto. I will deliver on its promise a stronger NHS, better schools, safer streets, control of our borders, protecting our environment, supporting our armed forces, levelling up. But nearly a year and a half in, the Prime Minister has failed to cut NHS waiting lists. His Rwanda migration policy has been blocked at every turn. And economic growth over the whole of last year was estimated at 0.1%. That is the weakest, by the way, since the 2008 financial crisis. And now the polls consistently show a commanding lead for Labour, making it likely 
the Tories will be obliterated at this year's general election. In fact, the latest poll shows Sunak could hold on to as few as 25 seats. This would be a historic defeat. So did our last two prime ministers inherit a poison chalice? Or is there a deeper level of dysfunction in Britain's leading party? And maybe the bigger question, is there anything the Tories can do to win back your vote? Well, open the lines on that now, 0344 499 1000. I'm joined today by Alex Crowley, campaigns and consultant, former Downing Street advisor. Um, Alex, afternoon to you. You probably recognised uh, a lot of what I said there. You probably thought I was being a bit mischievous in some of what I said there. A touch. But um, overarchingly, I mean, that is the story of Gosh, the you last know, few years. You know, it's, when, when you hear the whole story from start to finish, it just makes you feel exhausted, doesn't it? Yeah. Can you imagine how the electorate are feeling and this sort of constant political psychodrama? No wonder they have, uh, shall we say, uh, deadened their enthusiasm yeah. for, for the Conservative Party. Um, an awful lot has happened to the Conservatives in office which were not in their gift and control. But, of course, they've also done a lot of things in office as well to, to perhaps distract from the things that they promised to do. What I found, what I found interesting about that little montage was what um, Boris, to a lesser extent, Liz Truss, and certainly what Rishi Sunak was saying in terms of the substance was mm. broadly the same thing. Yeah, yeah. They were sort of promising basically the same thing that, that people gave them a mandate for in 2019. Uh, of course, what we've seen is that they haven't... None of them have had an ability to actually deliver it. Why? <laughs> I'll tell you why. Um, uh, and that's perhaps this is a lesson for uh, Starmer and the Labour Party, should they get in. There was a little thing called the pandemic in the middle. Yeah. And that changed everything uh, in some very, very important ways. It exposed the fact that the British state is completely dysfunctional, regardless of which politician you elect. Uh, we had to pay everyone to stay at home for a year, two years, which completely ruined the finances. So anyone promising any spending or tax cuts is, is, is sort of making it up because there is no money. And the reason why there's no money is because we spent it all during the pandemic and, of course, it exposed the flaws in the NHS. Yeah. So the, the fundamentals have completely changed and no politician and no political party has yet figured out how to deal with it. Just remind our audience who you were advising when you were in number 10. So I was advising Boris uh, before the pandemic, I hasten to say, before, before we get the, the, yep. the hate mail and the abuse. Um, and he was an interesting one because, you know, he won that majority. He was focused on the priorities of the electorate as they were at the time and still are with respect to the NHS and crime, etc. But one of his great flaws including, by the way, the huge distraction of the parties and, and the mm. misbehaviours during the pandemic, which he was rightly removed from office for. Um, one of his flaws was that he was too focused on the big, exciting things and not enough on the day-to-day -day detail. He couldn't drive the machine. And anyone who's spent five minutes in government will know, if you don't drive that machine, the machine will drive you. Yeah. And it will drive you to places that you don't want to go and that it will drive you to places that you didn't even expect to go. Did he think it was more of an automated system, that stuff happened, uh, you know, just not so much effortlessly, but there was a, a default gear that made things move? You, oh, didn't, yeah. you could tinker with things and advise, but broadly speaking, this big government machine moved along regardless. And, of course, it doesn't unless there's someone there to move it. Every Prime Minister comes in assuming that there is a system. Yeah. And assuming that there is a machine, that, 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 and their job is to tell the machine, well, could you go in this direction, please? Yeah. And the machine will go off and do it to a reasonable degree of competence. The truth is completely different. There, there is a machine, but it's not coherent. Yeah, it's yeah. not organised. It moves in several different directions at once. It has a lot of pressures placed, placed on it, of course. But it, it has a load of competing interests. And if you as a leader are not willing and prepared mm. to be really, really tough with it from day one, yep. like Mrs Thatcher was, like Tony Blair was to a certain extent, then you will get swamped. An, an average day in Downing Street is basically a collection of crises, right? Yep. From, the, from the first thing in the morning to the last thing at night, there's just a load of problems uh, that will hit you from every single direction. Mm -hmm. So you can go in there with a perfect plan, all laid out. Sunak went in there with his spreadsheets and said, right, we're going to do this, this and this. Yeah, yeah. Very, very well thought through and organised. Five minutes in government, all the crises hit you and it, and it gets torn up. And, of course, you go in, um, but naively, kind of assuming that everyone that's going to work with you, whether they're party um, employees or whether they're civil servants, that everyone's on the same 
Ah. Same she. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, nothing could be further from the truth, because no. even though it's the Conservative Party, there are 50 views on every issue. And we're talking oh, yes. big issues, big, not big just issues. small little kind now, of PS moments. Boris would have won his big majority in 2019 with a reasonable expectation that with an 80-odd majority, he would have a certain degree of flexibility and that his party would go with him on most things because they all stood on the same manifesto, and if you deliver the manifesto, then he shouldn't have any problems, right? Yeah. Wrong. <laughs> As every party leader finds, but Labour and Tory, exactly the same thing. Blair found this with 100-plus majorities. Your MPs sometimes have very different ideas yeah, yeah. about what should and shouldn't be done. Yeah. So you spend an awful lot of time trying to convince your own side, let alone anyone else in the country, that your particular plan is the right way to go. It, it is a complete Indeed. nightmare. It, I remember... Got to do it. Yeah, I think it was Blair that said that in their first... You know, just sort of couple of days in office, they were speaking to the sort of permanent secretary at the Department of Education or whatever, they said... They had a big list. They said, right, this is what we want to do, this is what we want to do, this, this, this and this and this. These are the big changes. Permanent secretary says, well, when do you, when, when do you want to achieve this? Oh, maybe six, seven weeks, something like that? I said, take you eight years to yeah, do that. Yeah, so yeah. what? Eight years? Exactly. Eight years? We've been planning this for eight years. We don't want to wait. Eight... But such is the, the, the turning around an oil tanker to get well, also, done. the machine that frequently willfully mis misinterprets. I'll give you a small example. I was on Boris's leadership campaign in 2019. A couple of weeks to go, you're preparing to go into Downing Street, and then the civil servants start turning up. And they start saying, well, you know, we've been keeping an eye on the contest and we've made a little record of the promises that, that Boris has made so we can start drawing up plans. Mm. Great, fantastic. Can I have a look at the list? Absolutely. You get the list, scanned out, yeah, yeah, OK, that's a pro that wasn't a promise, that definitely wasn't a promise. Then, of course, we, we looked at it and we thought, there's something missing from this list. We gave it back to them and said, what, what do you think's missing from this list, Mr Civil Servants? No idea. They'd left Brexit out. Right, that's quite a big Leaving thing Leaving the EU to by the 31st of October was Boris's yeah, yeah. headline pledge. They hadn't included it in their list that of pledges. That wasn't included. And wasn't people, say, people say the civil service don't have their eye on the ball. What are they talking about? Man well, alive. I mean, you could, look, let's be generous. They were either a little, They were either assumed that that was a given, yep. if I'm being really generous. Maybe. Could or be maybe, maybe their own views were creeping in there. Who knows? Is there a way, though? I mean, bearing in mind this latest Ipsos poll uh, covered on month, yesterday, I think it was, said the Tories could have as few as... As it was the 25 or 27 seats. I mean, this is sort of below Lib Dem territory. Yeah, it's pretty bad. This is like this, this is almost you will be the third party territory yeah. in Westminster. Um, is there a way? We're asking this question to our viewers. Uh, is there anything the Tories can do to, to win back your vote? We've got the phone lines on that open now. Could they, in this next five months, do anything that would seismically change the at least? to cushion the blow of what's going to happen at the next election? I think the big challenge for the party is that the, the electorate have almost got to the point where they've stopped listening. Yeah. And when that happens, there really is very little you can do as an incumbent to change their minds. The budget is a great example. We'll have a budget tomorrow. Presumably, they will have worked long and hard on some nice little gifts for the electorate that hopefully will convince them that there is you know, to stay with them. But... Here's my little theory about spending now, that tax and spending and the debate around it has completely changed since the pandemic. When you as a government have paid everyone to stay at home, there's literally nothing else you can Agreed. give them that is more impressive than that. So where, where <laughs> once... Very good there's point. nothing else you can give them, right? So yeah. the, where once there were very interesting, in, meaningful tax cut measures, etc., mm. people go, yes, that's great, I'm going to vote for that. Now it's like... Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, because no, nothing can supersede... Cost of living. Th that, that exactly. Moment. But it's could they not... I mean, is there not a little bit of... I was going to say mischief, but, you know, venality, whatever you want to call it, within a party that's clearly going to lose the next election, where you could just... Like, tomorrow, Jeremy Hunt could say, right, everyone's going on a four-day week, so it's got a hint of what you've just said. Four-day week, we're going to drop to that lower rate of tax, about 12 and a half grand at the moment until you start paying. We're going to raise that to £25,000. So, so it's sort of a doomsday kind of... It's a do yeah, do well, doomsday for the <laughs> Treasury and the next government, which won't be the Tories. But, but this, if you did that and said, no, we've costed it, and it looks as if you have, could you not go, OK, well, this 25 seats we're going to get has now ballooned to... 125 seats. That's that's assuming that sadly the electorate are fully engaged and listening and are still have some degree of, of hope about where things yeah. can change in the country. They haven't got that sadly. I hope that they can turn it around, obviously. But the actual, the, I think that the only the difference between a massive Starmer majority and a relatively small one is the electorate's willingness 
to buy what Starmer's offering. Yeah, There's yeah. still a lot of uncertainty about Starmer, not just him. There's loads. He's a bit of an empty vessel, frankly. You don't really know where, what he stands for. No. He seemed, look, he's perfectly nice, perfectly reasonable. He's not a threat in, that, in the sense that Jeremy Corbyn was. Yeah. But what people are concerned about is what is in the rest of the Labour Party? What is, can he keep control of the slightly more extreme elements in Labour if he gets in. That's yeah. the big question that he has not answered. And I suspect he will struggle to answer in an election campaign that, that, that hopefully will see the actual final result will be much narrower than people think. Well, for people like Thangham Debonair, by the way, who is the Shadow Culture Secretary, wants to ban rural Britannia. Ten oh. seconds, if you can, on that, Alex. How many times have we had this story oh, yes, loads come of round? Times. It's absolutely ridiculous. Just a she quick... says it alienates people. Oh, yeah. get in the bin, debonair. Well, a quick really. His... Well, maybe she should have uh, a quick history lesson. Why was Royal Britannia written? It was to celebrate the achievements of the Royal Navy in what? Stopping North African slave traders from stealing British citizens from the British Isles. That's actually why it was why why, why it was a commemoration of that. There it is. And very finally, Alex, Ipsos said twenty-five seats. What would you predict? Uh, I'm not going to make any predictions uh, because it will turn out to be wrong, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be back here talking about it. We will. Uh, good to see you, Alex. Thank you. Uh, Alex Corrali with us here on Talk TV. Coming up after the break with his party tanking in the polls and news he's more unpopular than Liz Truss, is it time for Rishi Sunak to hand over the keys of number 10 to Keir Starmer? We'll look at that. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. It's not been the best start to 2024 for the Prime Minister, I think we can safely say. Languishing behind Labour in the polls, his Rwanda plan grounded, finding out he's more unpopular with the public than Liz Truss. The list goes on, but the Conservatives insist they have a plan to turn their fortunes around. The Chancellor will unveil a 2% cut in national insurance in his budget tomorrow. Yippee! But wait... That's the same thing Jeremy Hunt did during the autumn statement, which did nothing to improve the Tories' poll numbers. Is it time for Rishi Sunak to call an election, get this thing done and let the British people decide? Let's ask that question to our next guest, Conservative MP and Treasurer of the 1922 Committee, Sir Geoffrey Clifton-Brown, is with us. Geoffrey, always good to gauge your view on these things. Hello, Ian. I mean, it must be... I mean, you're a seasoned parliamentarian. You've been around the block. Nothing phases you too much. You're old enough, I say that nicely, and wise enough, I say that nicely too, to know that, you know, that, that there are bumps in the road in this game called politics and sometimes you take the hits even if they hurt. But this is tragic terrain, is it not, for the Tories? This is the end game. It is the final phase, the cul-de-sac of governing. How does it feel? Well, it's not great, obviously. Uh, nobody wants to be in this position. But I liken it slightly like to a football match. When you're three quarters of the way through and you're four nil down, you don't hold your hands up and walk off the pitch. You keep fighting. And we've got to have an election uh, by January of next year, more likely in the autumn. Um, and and we, we've just got to try and keep improving things, prove to the electorate that we can actually deliver on behalf of the people of this country. And, you know, I'm not totally surprised we are where we are. We've had a bad run. We've had some bad by-elections. We've had the Lee um, uh, thing, uh, the announcement. Uh, we've had, got industrial action in the health service. And yet some of our other big things have not yet come through. As you were talking about the budget, we don't know what's going to be in the budget tomorrow. We don't know whether the Rwanda bill is going to go through before Easter. We think it will. We don't know when we can... Uh, move on from the industrial action in the health service and start improving those waiting lists. So there's a lot of uncertainties out there. And I, I think you'll find that in the next six months, uh, some of those will come good, if not all of them, and things will look a little different in the autumn. I mean, what could your party do? I mean, literally, what could you do, Geoffrey, to turn things around? If there's a lot of Conservative voters watching this now, Many will leg it to Reform UK. I, I think you guys are aware of that. Others will just stay at home. For, probably more people might well stay at home. But in big chunks, many may well vote Labour, even against their normal instincts, because they think, well, hang on, the greatest thing that Keir Starmer has is not some amazing font of wisdom. He's not the Oracle of Delphi. He's not the guy with all the answers. But he's also not Rishi Sunak. And that appears to be... His, his greatest asset at the moment. Is there anything the Tories can do to turn it around? Well, let me tell you where I think we are at the moment. Um, and I spend a, at least once, usually twice a week, out there on the doorsteps. <clears throat> and people are saying to me, uh, well, you haven't done very well. You've got to give us a reason to vote for you. And I think otherwise, a lot of people are not actually going to vote at all. I don't at the moment get many people who are saying to me we're going to vote reform, and I don't equally get many people who are rushing to say they want to vote for Keir Starmer. So I think if actually we can show the country that we can deliver and we can offer a better five-year prospect than the others, then I think some of those people at the moment who are not going to turn out and vote, and that's exactly what's happened in these by-elections, it's been a very, very low turnout simply because people don't see any point. If in the next six months we can give them a, a, a real point to come out and vote for us, then I think the situation could be very different. You, are you buying this idea that the Tories could be left with something like 25 seats? I mean, that's not just no, a bad I, I result. That's an I obliteration. No, no, no. No, Ian, I can't possibly buy that, because otherwise I don't get up in the morning. I, I've got to keep fighting. I've got to assume that we're going to win that election and I will do everything I possibly can to assist Rishi Sunak in doing that. Otherwise, I, 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 you know, I just can't, you know, I've got to, got to do that. That's my job in life. And I've got to work on the assumption that things will improve. Otherwise, one digs oneself into an early grave. What, what's the what, what's the mood among your fellow backbenchers, Geoffrey? What, what's, it, well, of course, what's it like not, being a not, Tory at the moment? Not, 
not brilliant at all. And I've been there before. I've been there when we've seen John Major's government going down week after week after week and Tony Blair coming in with a huge majority. Now, I hope that won't happen again, but I have been there before, so I know exactly what it feels like. As always, it's great to gauge your views on these things. Always very honest, Geoffrey. Thank you, Sir Geoffrey Clifton-Brown, Conservative MP Thank with you. us here on Talk TV. We will see you soon. Um, Alyssa Fitzgerald, our political correspondent, is with us. Um, there's a, quite a lot to unpick here. Yeah. Um, let's just start, because I could see you nodding away when he was saying, <laughs> you know, we don't know what's in the budget. Well, quite a lot of us well, we do We know seem exactly know. what's in the budget. Sorry. We know there's a little cut in national insurance. <laughs> we do, yes. So a 2% cut in national insurance. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we heard in the autumn statement uh, at the end of last year that there was a small cut in national insurance then. Jeremy Hunt is pushing that one step further and, and adding a bit more to that. But in terms of whether people actually really feel that in their pockets, it's not going to make a huge amount of difference. Obviously, it's really welcome, but there obviously are a lot of other increases that we're seeing just in the cost of living at the moment yeah. that kind of seem to balance it out a little bit. Well, it's bit. the air bubble, isn't it? So if you, take, if you whack 2% out there, it pops up somewhere yeah. else because there is only a certain amount of, you know, you've got to raise this amount of money. Uh, in order to keep things running. It's mm -hmm. as simple as that. So you can rob Peter to pay Paul, but how you choose to do it Peter is up Cardwell. to you. <laughs> Peter yeah, Rob Peter rob Cardwell, Cardwell, get him to pay for everything. Uh, that's, that's the answer. Uh, I mean, it's going to be interesting because nobody's going to go to work, are they, on Thursday morning and go, here, yeah, Bob, do you hear about the, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're eight quid a week better off. It's not, it doesn't really land, as the phrase goes. A cut, a cut is great, mm -hmm. but... The idea there's been a seismic shift, a positive seismic shift in your life, your disposition, your cost of living, that's what you've got to try and create. And I just don't think they've got the... They, they haven't got the money to do it and they haven't got the political fuel in the tank to do it. Definitely. And they love to use this big phrase of tax cuts, which is kind of a headline grabber. And it makes people think, brilliant, I'm going to be paying less tax and I'm therefore going to be richer as a result yeah. of that. But when you look at the amount that you can feasibly cut tax in one budget or one autumn statement, it can't be that much. And the trouble is, is the government have a difficult task in that they saw what happened with Liz Truss's mini budget where she did try and cut taxes, <laughs> but those were just unfunded, which then caused a, a raft of issues that, <laughs> that we, yeah, all, yeah, we yeah. all saw happen really, really quickly. So the government wants to make sure they don't mirror that and they want to make sure that anything they do is fully costed and doesn't kind of have any huge long-lasting impacts that, that, like what happened after the mini-budget, but they also yeah. need to make sure that the public feel like they're actually doing something to help their lives and that's the, the, the line they have to turn. Well, it did, because when you look back, if you were to just have a cursory look, just Google um, protests over the last five years and, and the kind of banners that people have been waving... They may well be on the issue of immigration. They might be on the issue of the NHS. They mm. could be on lockdowns. I never saw a banner that said, we want a tax cut now. It doesn't... But there's still almost a kind of an old... And I think it is a sort of an old school. So of course, we want... Notionally, we want tax cuts. Mm. But there is something about... It's a bit like the word fracking. If the word fracking wasn't so onomatopoeic, then I don't think people would ask for it. It sounds well hard, doesn't it? Well, we want fracking! You know, start fracking. People get very... They bang the table when they say the word fracking. That's what, we don't need to do all this green stuff. Fracking, that's all we need. People go nuts for the word fracking. And I, tax, tax cuts, yeah, tax cuts and fracking. That's what's happening here. They want the, those two things. They sound really, re like, you mean real business. Yeah. But actually, when you break it all down, tax cuts, tax... Schmutz, you know, I mean, it's great to have <laughs> on them. on a T-shirt. I'll stick it on a T-shirt. <laughs> Frankie says, you die. This is the next one. Um, you're right. It's, it's just a, a, a great mantra. We all aspire to it, but I don't think it's the game changer that some Tories think it is. Well, this is it, but we have to look at it from the Conservatives' point of view, and that is that, historically, they have been seen as the party for lower taxes. And at the moment, we have the highest tax burden in ages, it's in 70 years, which is a very long time. Yep. So for the Conservatives going into the next general election, they're going to look at this and think, hang on, what is one of our key things, the key kind of ethos of being a Conservative, one of which is lower taxes. And that's something they definitely have not achieved. Yes. So they want to go into this election, but be able to say, we are the party of lower taxes, mm -hmm. potentially lowering them to a point that Labour, if they do get into government, can't sustain. So therefore they can come back and say, we are the party of lower taxes. Look what you've got with the Labour Party.
There it is. Um, Alicia, thank you. Come back on our fracking special as well, won't I've you? I've got the budget special. It's good. Oh, of course, well, yes. So. Yeah, yeah, we'll be speaking that as well. Uh, thank you to Alicia. We've been asking that question. Is there anything the Tories can do to win back your vote? Uh, let's talk to Martin, who's down in London. How are you doing, Martin? Well, thank you. Good. Fire away, sir. What do you think? Well, there is something that the Tories can do to bring back everyone's votes. Go up? Yes, it's to bring back Boris. You think? Yeah, it's not rocket science. Look at the facts. He won the 2019 election virtually single-handed yeah. with a landslide. And I'm a, re I'm a supporter of Jeremy Corbyn. So, I mean, you know, it, if it, it'll convince me, it'll convince anyone. So, you're... <laughs> since, since so yeah, OK, the so your party but... has wrecked what he did by dumping him in a typical Tory high-handed way. If only they would eat some humble pie and bring him back, then they'd win the election. But okay. is that... Look, I, I hear what you're saying, Martin. If you look at the graph, if you employ some basic mathematics to the equation, then what could go wrong? This bloke had a, an 80-plus seat majority. But a lot happened in the time. The whole Downing Street party thing, a lot of his own yeah, colleagues, well, yeah, a lot of his yeah, own supporters so, said, hang on a sec, this guy's got to go. Events to your boy, events. But the long and the short of it is, Boris wins elections. If you want to win the election, hire Boris. There it is. Martin, thank you very much indeed. Uh, powerful stuff from a Corbyn supporter. Bring back Boris. Is that the answer? Next, a Palestinian woman who is responsible for, was responsible for hijacking two passenger planes is being lined up to speak at a fundraising event in Birmingham. Leela Khalid has been criticised for describing Hamas terrorists who killed 1,200 people in Israel on October the 7th as freedom fighters. She's due to speak via video at a fundraiser organised by the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign, the same group that projected the anti-Semitic from the river to the sea message onto the side of Big Ben last month. I'm joined now by counter-terrorist expert Dr David Lowe um, to talk about this. David, good afternoon to you. Uh, I was only thinking at the weekend, I haven't spoken to David Lowe for a little while, and uh, up your pop on a Tuesday. How fantastic. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because history is full of people who had nefarious, horrible ideas about stuff and sometimes carried out terrible things, um, but then found themselves around the big oak, oak cabinet table years later. Um, it's not entirely unprecedented that someone who's got a shady past... Uh, pitches up to give a public speech somewhere? No, I mean, you know, if, if we look historically, um, we only have to look to the UK after the Gulf Friday Agreement. Yep. We, we've got a number of politicians who are former members of the provisional IRA. Um, you know, but I think what's important on this one, though, Ian, is what she's saying about Hamas in the UK. Hamas is a prescribed terrorist organisation. I think currently, politically... Uh, and socially, with the, with the issue of Gaza and the protests here, um, we're seeing fringe groups attaching themselves uh, to, to large demonstrations. And I'll, I'll emphasise the point that most of these demonstrations, they're not extremists, but some extremists are uh, latching on to it, uh, which is a problem. And, of course, on top of that, then they're sort of feeding the far right with propaganda and they're making hay on that. As you, as you, you know, you had that protest the other week, and you have from the river to the sea, uh, emblazoned on uh, the uh, Victoria Tower there, Westminster. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, these, these these are important issues that we're looking at, and it only takes a little spark for some individual to carry out some form of terrorist attack. And currently, at the moment, we're in a little tinderbox. I don't think it's being helped by some politicians, or the former prime minister. Uh, former Home Secretary, some of the comments that they've said, or been at meetings where some comments have been said and they totally ignored it. Uh, I think Rishi Sunak, when he came out the other day, was a little too little, a little too late uh, in what he, the message he was trying to get across. I mean, some, I suppose, David, because uh, I, I hear everything you just said, but th th there might be some who would extrapolate from this, actually. It, it proves the kind of the Lee Andersons of him, when we forget the fact that he, you know, what he said was just not true about Sadiq Khan, but the, the point we think he was trying to get to was that there is a sort of an Islamist thing going on that seems to be getting a little bit too much publicity and uh, is lacking condemnation from many areas. I think that's where he meant to go, and that would have been fine if he'd gone there. 
But does this not feed into that? This is not... To many of those people, whether it's Lee Anderson, whether it's Suella Braverman, uh, whether it's some people also in the Labour Party, may look at this and go, no, this is exactly the problem. You know, we are legitimising what would have been unthinkable just a couple of years ago, inviting somebody like this to speak, even allowing the group they're speaking with or for uh, is, is, is a bit iffy, but, you know, allowing this character to pitch up does feed into that belief that Islamism is going unchecked. Well, it does appear, um, you know, if, if you look at the surface of it, it does appear that way. Uh, Leela Khalid, uh, she's had a uh, visa... Uh, not back before when she's wanted to come and speak here. There was another one she did in the uh, University of Leeds uh, in 2020. Again, it was online, uh, and that, you know, there's no permission given for that, and that caused great consternation at the time, certainly uh, within, not, not just within the university, where you have the uh, different student unions uh, up in arms about it. Um, but, you know, compared 2020 to 2024, we are... Uh, in an area where you've got some really volatile points of view. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, yeah, what, what, what the answer was saying, you know, um, I think he went too far saying, yes, you know, extremists are, are taking over the country. And I think he was pointing more at the Islamists uh, on that point. I think that was going too far. But what we are seeing, what, what does uh, distress me a little bit, is where protests are being held. Fine outside Parliament Square, town halls in the cities and towns of this country, that's legitimate. But you go outside an MP's house with their family, with children. No, that 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 is where a line has to be drawn. Yeah. Um, that you know that is intimidatory, and some of the things that you're hearing, some of these on the fringes of these groups, where they're calling that lesser jihad or holy war, where they're called praising Hamas. Uh, you know, we, we, they're, they're starting to commit offences here when, when we start to look at some of these things. Are they glorifying acts of terrorism? That's on the terrorism act. Are they giving? Uh, support for a terrorist group. That's on the terrorism act. These are serious offences here. Yeah, t t totally. And it is intriguing, you know, how... I mean, we remember back in the day when Mrs Thatcher had Sinn Féin speaking via helium balloons, essentially. It was ridiculous. While, while Simul Telly says, we now know, conversations were going on behind the scenes. And, you know, there is always a point where the unthinkable... Uh, becomes a reality. I mean, even Nelson Mandela was ja was jailed for terrorist crimes. He eventually becomes the president and one of the most respected figures of his time. Um, so that it may in, in 10, 20 years' time, if she were to speak somewhere, perhaps people would say, "Well, we, you know, th this was unpalatable back then, but now it's inevitable." But it is about timing, isn't it? I mean, October the seventh is barely six months away. For somebody to even suggest that people responsible for the wholesale slaughter and all sorts of other horrendous crimes, to suggest that they were perpetrated by freedom fighters is not somebody you should be inviting around the debating table to break bread with, regardless of what yeah, you I think of the overarching view. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, certainly not at the moment. And, of course, you know, of course, of course there's, there's, there are legitimate voices in these pro-Palestinian protests. You know, we, we are looking at a government in Israel um, and how they're, carry, how they're carrying out this, this conflict at the moment. And we are looking at innocent civilians who are being killed or made homeless, being injured, and we're, and we're looking at that. But that's a legitimate voice, but somehow it's getting lost a little bit to some of the extremists. And you're quite right. I mean, you know, you, you as I said, you, you look at the Good Friday Agreement, uh, and of course, John Major was absolutely crucial in setting that up. I mean, yeah. it, it was a long pathway. It wasn't just the Labour government. Obviously, Home Rule was absolutely crucial when she was Secretary of State for Northern Ireland at the time. Um, I'm bringing that together, as well as the likes of John Hume from the SDLP, sure. David Tremble from the Ulster Unionist Party. Absolutely key figures. That was a long road to get to uh, the Good Friday Agreement. True. And, you know, as I said before, you, you look at it, some of those who were uh, either loyalist or... Um, Republican terrorists are now politicians. Yeah. Um, and so things can improve. But at this moment, this is not the time to invite yeah, the you're, you're spot on. The there UK. is there there is irredeemably an issue of timing. Uh, many other factors in this, but certainly timing. David, thank you as ever. Dr David Lowe, who is a terrorism commentator, um, uh, always great to gauge his views on these things. Thank you to him.
Coming up after the break, Birmingham's bankruptcy is set to cause major problems for residents as the council tries to save, are you ready, £300 million. Pounds. We'll talk about that next time. Ian Collins, or we talk on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, streetlights could be turned off and bin collections slashed as Birmingham Council looks to approve a £300 million worth of tax cuts in a bid to balance their books. Council tax will rise by around 21% over the next two years after the local authority declared bankruptcy at the end of last year. These residents have told us they're already being affected. People are affected um, on, a, on a really basic level. I know the bins weren't collected recently and that, that was a big problem. The uh, crisis at the moment is just taking all the money out of our accounts and increasing council tax is just going to tip us over the edge. There's a lot of anger, especially with the uh, city going into bankruptcy of the council. Like, um, where's all the money gone? How was it spent? There's clearly not been the best management of services for quite a while. So actually, if anything, hopefully it'll bring some innovation, some change, opportunity to actually sort some stuff out. Well, joining us now, Conservative councillor for Sutton Mere Green, Myrian Jenkins is with us. Um, good afternoon to you. I mean, whatever way you slice this one, it's going to be a grim few years for the residents of Birmingham. Oh, it, it certainly is, Ian. Um, due to the disastrous mismanagement uh, of the council by this Labour administration, people are being asked to pay 21% more in council tax. And remembering that since 
they came to power in 2012. That means the increase is now at 77%. I mean, these are huge figures. Lots of reasons behind this. I mean, we can talk about mismanagement. That there were some other, what they would describe, the governing Labour Party would describe as out of their control. What's your response to that? Uh, not, not really. No. I mean, if you if you look at the uh, money that's provided by central government, Birmingham has more to spend per dwelling than Manchester or Leeds. So Birmingham is treated quite well in terms of the funding that it gets from government and government funding represents about 80% of, of Birmingham's income. No, what's happened in Birmingham to cause the bankruptcy is the direct consequence of a series of terrible misjudgments that have taken place over the decade that I've been a councillor. But just recently, the, the two that, that have really tipped it over the edge uh, are the failure on the equal pay um, uh, administration that Labour didn't undertake, and, and also their failure to implement a new accounting system, the Oracle implementation, which has been a complete train crash. I mean, it was supposed to cost 20 million. Mm. The cost is now exceeding 100 million. And we're still not in a position where the officers have accurate accounting information. Now, regardless of where anybody sits politically, uh, despite the fact that you opposing, um, of course, the, the governing party, um, there's nothing that can be done now. These cuts are going to have to happen. What will that look like in practice for residents in your area? Uh, yes, that's right. As, as you said, um, well, in your introduction, you said 300 million of tax cuts. Well, I think you meant 300 million of savings. So the council has to take yeah. 300 million pounds off each year's current account expenditure. Um, and and it's, it's doing that by a mixture of council tax increases, um, savings in terms of reduction of services but that's not going anywhere near far enough they're having to sell off uh, all sorts of different assets and even when they've done that they're still going to have to borrow more money from government at premium rates so, so it's a, a whole whole range of things but it's remarkable isn't it that you know it, it's, it's hard to imagine any sort of area of c commercial commerce where somebody would do such a terrible job for you mm -hmm. and their response would be to ask for a 21 percent price increase yes. and yet you know here we are in government yep. um the the worse they perform and the more of your money they lose the bigger the council tax increase they seem entitled to ask for so we're going to be looking at slashing bin collections they could co go down to every two weeks some were saying every three weeks Correct. i don't know if that's even possible um a, a hike in council tax no nice flower displays outside the ball ring i mean the list goes on i would imagine Oh, oh, it's it's significant. Uh, for, for example, the library budget has been cut by two thirds, which I think effectively means that two thirds of the city's libraries will have to close. Wow. As you rightly say, we're going from weekly to fortnightly bin collections. And there's a whole host of other things. But I think another important point to remember here is that Labour have known about this situation since last July. Right maybe even further than that. And yet it's taken them seven months to bring this budget here today. And, and yeah. even now, it's not really it's not really a budget in because it's full of reviews. You know, it's saying things like, we'll review the provision of library service, we'll review the provision of youth services. So even now, they don't actually know specifically uh, what, what they're going to do. And, it, and in order to get to this point, to, to try and balance the budget, they've had to agree to uh, extra funding from government. So they haven't even now, in terms of having to make these savings, they haven't even now been able to identify about 40% of the specific savings that they have to make. Yeah. So it's a very poor process. This is uh, breathtaking incompetence. I think we can agree on that. Marian, thank you. Marian we certainly Jenkins. can agree on that. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> Conservative <laughs> councillor <laughs> with us here on on Talk TV. I think this all feeds into a, a, a bigger issue about the relationship we have with politicians. Um, everybody has their eye on Westminster. We're going to come back to that question about the Tories in just one second. Uh, but actually, I've often said this, the biggest, some of the biggest stories uh, about the world of politics, ineptitude, sometimes corruption, but breathtaking incompetence, is actually in local government, it's in town halls, it's in county council chambers, it's in big city halls around the country. That's where you find some real gems of just how bad politicians are. And they've forgotten the central agreement that it's us that pays them. They work for us. There's even websites to that name. It's not hard to understand, and I think that relationship and politicians, local or national, 
have forgotten that, and the Tories certainly have, because they're about to be obliterated at the next election, despite that thumping majority back in 2019. What could they do to win back your vote? That's the question we're asking. Jill's in Cornwall on this very point. What do you think, Jill? Good afternoon. Oh, gosh, Ian. You've brought up so many points that I really agree with. Local councils, everything. Look, I, I'm not saying for one minute that I think the... Conservatives are going to win the next election. But what I get hacked off with is these polls that suggest that um, uh, li the Conservatives are um, down by so many points, that the Labour Party yep. is up. By. I've never been asked, and I don't know of anyone who's been asked, to take part in one of these polls that give <laughs> the statistics that they quote. You know, I mean, where do they come from, these things? You know, I do think that a lot of people will um, stay away from local elections until they have to go yeah. and vote in the, the main election. And I, I, I think, like with Brexit, it could be a surprise. could be that... Um, it it could be. So you're not... <clears throat> when you heard that figure, Jill, that, it, it, yeah. that the Tories could get as uh, little as 25 seats, you, you obviously, you're, you're, you're suspicious about that. What do you think, then, in your kind of political instinct, they yeah. might get, even if they're going to lose? Well, I think that the way the other parties are going, um, to be perfectly honest, whether we want to vote Conservative or not, if we don't vote Conservative, then the Labour Party could get in and bring with it everything that it has at the moment, which I think is worse than what yeah. the Conservatives are offering. Um, I, I mean, I, I just I just can't believe how these parties are behaving the way they are and getting and we're paying well, them. I, for I, I agree with you. I can understand why people are racked off with the Tories and they think yeah. I don't want to vote for them again. What I don't understand is why the Labour Party, as far as I can see, haven't got a policy between them are the, the chief beneficiaries of the Tories' woes. If you're a lifelong Conservative, I mean, it's extraordinary that you would suddenly say, well, I'm done with the Blues, I'm going to vote for Keir Starmer. Why? Well, I don't really know, really. He's Keir Starmer. He hasn't got any policies, he hasn't got anything specific he's offering me. I don't know whether his political antenna has been sharpened for about six decades, but I'll vote for him anyway. I mean, that's no way to employ democracy, surely. Sadly, we've come to the end of the show, but thank you for tuning in. Don't forget, we're back tomorrow, same time, 3 o'clock. I'm returning at 6pm this evening on The Talk, but up next, it's Vanessa Feltz. Have a good afternoon. A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would nice to put a statue of the Queen on the